Hi everyone and welcome back to Women vs Everything. This is a podcast about awesome women throughout history and the oppression they overcame and the awesome things that they achieved. Uh, I'm Jess, I'm here with my lovely co-host Grace. That's me. Feel free to support us on the internet. We are on Instagram at Women vs Everything. We are on Gmail, Women vs Everything. And Patreon, Women vs Everything. We're WV Everything Pod on Twitter and Buy Me a Coffee. Yes, and if you can support us financially, obviously we love that. We're putting all the money back into making the show super awesome and paying our wonderful editor and all those kinds of things. But if you can't do that, then just sharing your favourite episode, giving us a like on social media, telling your friends, all of that just really, really helps more people to find the show and keep, helps us to keep making independent, awesome feminist media. Listen, I need those numbers of downloads for validation. <laughs> I check them every night before I go to sleep. So make us feel good about ourselves, please. Because we all need a little more of that at the moment. Don't we? I mean, speaking of which, uh, how's life going for you, Jess? Um, yeah, okay, actually. Did I tell you about the crazy birthday adventure? No. It was my birthday a couple of weeks ago, and me and my partner and a few friends went axe throwing. Oh, yes! Oh my god, I saw this on your Instagram. It was so much fun. Highly recommend. Very cathartic. Just sharp objects flying through the air. And I'm extremely clumsy. What could possibly go wrong? Mm-hmm. Um, but no one died. No one ended up in A&E. And it was fun. Yeah, so that was good. And then I ate a bunch of sushi, which is always a good thing. What else? Other than that, I've been uh, catching up on work. I'm still a little bit behind from my trip to Winchester a few weeks ago. I've been um, seeing some friends and I had my first session with a personal trainer this morning. So I'm a little bit sore right now. It's fine. Your first session? Yes. I can see muscles on you already. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about you? How's your week been? What have you been up to? Honestly, I listened to an entire audiobook for this episode, <laughs> so I feel like I've done nothing but that. <laughs> it's a great use of time. I mean, you know. The best. I've been a little bit in podcast world because um, I've had some meetings about doing some stuff to do with our podcast and researching for this episode, and then one of my rabbits got ulcers in her eye. And mm, she needs, thing. yeah, she needs six eye drops a day. So that's kind of consumed my life, basically. <laughs> and mm. then I've just rested. So it's been a pretty boring one for me, but I've got some exciting stuff coming up in July, which is fine. I'm going camping with a few friends next weekend, supposedly. Oh, that sounds good. I say supposedly because um, the weather is shit and... No one's offered to, like, do all the work for me yet, so. <laughs> I hate camping. Me too. <laughs> like, really, really hate, actually. It would encourage me to go camping if there was axe throwing. Yeah. I went um years, in, like, in another lifetime when I was living in England. I went to a brilliant summer festival called Sword Punk, and it was that all... sounds awesome. Just yeah. on the name, I want to go. You'd have loved it. It was, like... All that sword throwing, archery, sword throwing, knife throwing, <laughs> and axe throwing. It was so much fun. There was like circus skills. There was all these fun workshop welding during the day. Amazing. Yeah, I did some welding. I felt very butch. And yeah, love it. Yeah, loads of like really fun stuff like that. That sounds really fun. I want to go to that. That was worth camping for. Yeah. That's the best review I can give anything. Yeah, that's fair. So pretty boring life the last few weeks, but... So apart from the audiobook for this podcast, have you watched, listened to, or read anything interesting recently that you would like to talk about? No! <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I also started, and it's pretty... I feel like a bit of a queer failure for not having consumed this media before, but I just got started getting into Shit's Creek. Um, I've never seen it apart from, like, the first two episodes. Really? It's really good. yeah. A friend of mine recommended it to me and I tried it and I, d I didn't know the first couple of episodes I didn't get into. I should probably give it another go and try and watch it for longer. That definitely happened to me before I watched the first couple of episodes. Whereas I found this time rewatching it, it was really good. 
Awesome. I will give it another go. What about you? Tell the lovely people about media you've been consuming. Uh, my partner and I are still working our way through the last season of The Expanse. We've only got two episodes to go now and I, I have... Truly, there is so much plot. I have absolutely no idea how on earth they're going to wrap it all up in two more episodes and I fear <laughs> it's going to be quite rushed. Okay. But we shall see. Um, so we've been enjoying that and we're trying to decide what we're going to watch next when we've when we've finished with that. Um, oh, I went to the theatre last night. That was nice. Ooh, what did you go see? I went to see The Producers, mm. which is a comedy musical about a pair of Broadway producers who try to pull off a scam that involves putting on a show that is guaranteed to fail. Excellent. Oh, yes, and I've heard of this one. Yeah. Yeah, there was a film of it in about 2005. But yeah, I went to see a stage production of it, which was very good. Um, it is hilarious um, and ridiculous. Yeah, so that was fun. I'm seeing a lot of theatre this month, actually. I've got quite a few things booked, which is which is very nice. So looking forward to that. Excellent. Oh, have you seen Disney's animation Turning Red? No. And I think I should because people keep saying how good it is. I watched it for the first time when I was in a very, um, let's say, neurodivergent phase of just constantly bouncing between Hamilton and Encanto. <laughs> and I see zero downsides to this, honestly. <laughs> exactly. Well, all other media seems rubbish is the downside. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so I yep. was like, yeah, it's good. I get it. It's not amazing. And then I recently rewatched it and I was like, oh my God, this is actually great. It is so amazing. So I would recommend okay. that. I will give that a go. Yeah, that's another one that has been recommended to me a lot and I just haven't got round to yet. Yeah, it is super um, cringe, huh. which is being a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> Relatable. I'll grow out of it any day now. <laughs> Given that you have 28 pages of notes, shall we crack <laughs> on with the topic? <laughs> Can we just actually tell the listeners about like... So our Catherine Johnson episode has just been published and our editor yes. had to delete out 15 minutes of us talking about the show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. <laughs> yes, we went we went down a rabbit hole with that one, didn't we? Um, but it's just so good. And, and when I meet people who love it as much as I do, I need to talk to them about it because it's just so great. I'm honestly proud of us. And this is the kind of content you can expect from a live show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah perfect but that yeah. that is going to get that outtake is going to get published on the patreon at some point right right i mean go join our patreon just to listen to us squee about crazy ex-girlfriend say which of the boys we would fuck marry kill and which character we are yes 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 find out why the character that i relate to the most is daryl and find out what our favourite <laughs> songs are. You just spoiled it. Yes, you spoiled the surprise. <laughs> no one's going to join our Patreon now. <laughs> <laughs> but I still don't know which character you are. I think it's pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell the lovely listeners what content I gave you to research, which is the background content for this person? Yeah, so some of the details that Grace gave me were, obviously we start with the dates, which was 1727 to 1797, uh -huh. uh, so 18th century. Uh, the location is Dublin, Ireland, and some of the themes included uh, sex work, gang violence, uh, something called Poining's Law, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, the 1700s penal laws in Ireland, Oliver Cromwell and all of the various shit that he did, and Jonathan Swift and his uh, satire work. So there's there's lots uh, lots going on here. Uh, where should we start? <laughs> Do you want to tell? Well, why don't you tell us who we're talking about? Okay, I am going to tell you about Peg Plunkett, also known as Margaret Leeson, who also used the courtesan name Mrs. Leeson. She had affairs and financial arrangements with the cream of Irish society in the 18th century. Uh, with titled men, two viceroys, captains, barristers, lawyers. She was the most famous brothel keeper in Ireland and the first to publish her memoirs. Wow. She used her memoirs as an expose to name and shame those who had not honoured their financial debts to her. Wow. And the list was so long, it took up three volumes. <laughs> <laughs> And you had until the third volume to pay up and she sent the people that owed her money drafts and you had until it, its official publication to pay up. 
she does a wonderful picture of 18th century women as victims and as independent women mm. so uh, my sources are her own memoirs are available online and my biggest source was the Julie Peakman book um, which I listened to as an audiobook Peg Plunkett Memoirs of a Whore and if you are going to listen to that book just I want to just say like it is a little bit victim blaming it's not quite so trauma aware as I think it should be um, it does mm-hmm. kind of be like oh Peg goes from disastrous relationship to disastrous relationship and I'm like well yeah she probably had CPTSD she grew up with no positive male role models and it doesn't quite acknowledge all of that for her mm-hmm. and also Peg herself hated the, the word whore she preferred nymph or impure <laughs> huh. and you know I've been to lots of places and I myself quite often use the word whore as a like take back empowering way and I don't feel like that's done in this memoir, you know. You feel like it's being used as a put down. Or just as uh, as a neutral way, you know, using a slur in a neutral way as opposed to a, like how empowering way. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So Peg would have been born, it's thought she was born between 1736 and 1742 in County West Meath. Oh, that's interesting. So we don't actually know quite what her date of birth was. No, there wouldn't have been great records. She was the daughter of an Irish landowner and therefore had some form of aristocracy. Her mother's cousin was an earl. Her parents were first cousins, which was a connection that was discouraged, but many wealthy families encouraged it as a way of keeping blood pure and was brought up in the Catholic faith. Uh huh. Do you want to say a bit about what the Irish world was like in those years, 1736? So by round about 1700, um, Dublin was the second largest city in the British Empire, as it was at the time, with a population of about 60,000. So it was it was already sort of a very big hub, I suppose, at that time. So probably best to go back a little bit. So in the 1600s, so in 1649 to 1653, there was what was called the Cromwellian Conquest of Ireland or the Cromwellian War in Ireland. And this was where the English forces led by Oliver Cromwell essentially invaded Ireland um, on behalf of England's, the Rump Parliament at, at the time. Was this under Elizabeth I or Henry VIII? Charles I. Oh, okay. Charles, Charles I was king from 1625 to 1649. Do not emphasise this enough in the Groenio Whale episode, but Elizabeth I already had a horrific rule over Ireland. Mm -hmm. So Oliver Cromwell was just sent in as like someone to reinforce the servitude of Irish people, I guess. I think that's fair to say. Like the the Irish were definitely getting a really rough deal from the English being terrible at this point. So there was something called the Irish Rebellion in 1641. And at that point, most of Ireland came under the control of the Irish Catholic Confederation. Mm-hmm. But then in 1649, they allied with the English Royalists, who had been defeated in the English Civil War. And then by May of 1652, Cromwell's army had defeated that Confederate and Royalist coalition in Ireland and essentially had, had occupied the country. And that ended what was known as the Irish Confederate Wars or the Eleven Years' War. Mm. And Cromwell, being the delightful human that he was, no, he was terrible. He passed a series of penal laws against Roman Catholics, specifically Uh, which was the vast majority of the population in Ireland at the time. Uh, He confiscated huge amounts of their land, um, and specifically as punishment for the 1641 rebellion, almost any lands that were owned by Irish Catholics were taken away and were given to the British settlers instead. And Catholics were barred from taking part in the Irish Parliament. They were forbidden to live in many towns. They were forbidden from marrying Protestants. So there'd been this brutal conquest... And then all of these laws were put in place which disenfranchised and oppressed a huge, huge percentage of the population. And this source says Cromwell remains a deeply reviled figure in Ireland. In London, it is Irish tradition to get a photo of yourself giving the middle finger to the statue of Oliver Cromwell. That's amazing. Have you done it? No, actually, I didn't even know about this till after I left London. And when you come over, we should find it so you can do that. We'll do that on our tour, Jess. He is disappointingly still revered and quotes of his are still used in a lot of the religious texts for the Church of England. So he was like Mm -hmm. 
really deeply Christian, you know, and I've discussed this a lot with a friend of mine who is a, a vicar in the Church of England and he just seemed to have this horrendous blind spot about Roman Catholics that he just thought he was doing the right thing. And one of his most famous quotes is to hell or to Connacht, because it was basically all the Irish people were displaced from their lands and sent to Connacht, which is a really beautiful part of Ireland, but the land wasn't very conducive to farming. Mm -hmm. So you could go there and eventually starve, basically. Oh God. Or be murdered. Yeah. So Cromwell was kind of terrible. Um, Interesting fact, he was also a descendant of Thomas Cromwell, who was one of Henry VIII's chief ministers and closest advisors. Ugh. Until Henry had him executed. Yeah, so the the impact of this, this war and this invasion on the Irish population was huge and it's very it, it's not very well recorded kind of how many people died as a result but there's estimates that fall anywhere between 15 and 50 percent of the native irish population were, yeah. were were killed in this and then the war caused a famine which was then worsened when there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague also known as the black death and some of the estimates of the drop in numbers of the total Irish population go as high as 83%. Yeah, there's still campaigns today to get this labelled as a genocide. I mean, honestly, that seems like an appropriate label. Yeah. That really seems like that's what it was. Yeah. I always say it, Irish people have this weird thing as white people where we still have a lot of privilege, but we've also been very, very oppressed. So yeah, we have this very strange um, relationship to privilege and our positions in the world today. Absolutely. Just to talk a little bit more about these these laws. So the, the Irish penal laws of 1695, they intensified the divide between the Protestants and the, and the Irish Catholics. And they stripped away a lot of religious freedom. And they meant that Catholics couldn't hold a commission in the army. They couldn't enter various professions. They couldn't own a horse worth more than five pounds. They couldn't own weaponry. They couldn't study law or medicine. And they couldn't speak or read Gaelic or play Irish music. Mm-hmm. This is reminding me of like the the Nazi enforcements in the Louisa Gould episode. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I had that thought too. Control and suppression for the obvious purpose of making sure that, that the, the people they were oppressing couldn't rise up and overthrow their colonisers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The English colonisers also changed some of the rules around land ownership. There was something called the Popery Act of 1703, which forbade Catholics to pass down land to their eldest son, and it instead required that landowners had to distribute any land that they owned equally amongst all of their sons. Mm -hmm. And if the family only had daughters, then the lands also had to be split equally among them. And the end result of all this was that by the end of that year, 1703, the Irish Catholics were 90% of Ireland's population but owned less than 10% of the land. Yeah, the Plunkett family avoided this because they became Protestants. Oh, interesting. They secretly still practised Catholicism. Oh, wow. So they pretended to convert, essentially. Yeah, and if you go wow. to places in Ireland, you there's quite often, like, in fields, you'll see, like, three big rocks, like, formed like a table. Mm. And that was basically, like, makeshift altars so people could go and receive communion and practise Catholicism. Oh, wow. In secret, poor Peg's mother had 22 children. Oof. Yeah, of which only eight survived. And Peg was protected from life outside her estate. So she wouldn't have been witness to much of the horror that was going on in the outside Mm -hmm. world. She was provided a good education. There was lots of music and dancing and soirees at Neighbours. And in her memoir, she says, Life glided on in the path of innocence and content. But that all changed when she was 15 and her mom died, possibly from typhus or meningitis. Hmm. And all the children were sent away to relatives to try and stop the spread of the disease. Peg's oldest brother stayed behind in this like really, you know, stupid patriarchal thing they do, where the oldest brother is the head of the household. And he also died, sadly. And this all kind of led to the destruction of her world and, quote, the source of all my misfortune. So her dad already had rheumatism, but now he also was, you know, in severe grief. And it sounds like he was depressed. Yeah. And was left unable to manage his household. So he basically handed over all the running of the house to the eldest remaining son on the condition that he would look after his siblings. 
Mm -hmm. And this brother became an absolute prick, a total bully, very aggressive. And he spent a lot of the money on his own entertainment, but he would refuse to spend money on the siblings. One sister was already married. One of Peg's older sisters, these two older sisters of Peg's feature quite heavily in the story. One of Peg's older sisters went to visit this married sister in Dublin and she was flocked by suitors. She came home with like seeking the blessing of a marriage proposal and her brother mm-hmm. refused because he didn't want to pay the dowry. Ugh. But her suitor said, that's fine. I don't need the dowry. I love her. And the brother protested the marriage regardless because at that point, if he said, OK, it, it would be public knowledge that the reason he said no would be because he didn't want to pay the dowry. Mm-hmm. So they eventually managed to get the father's blessing and denouncing their brother's behaviour. So this is the kind of asshole he was. So then it was Peg's turn to go to Dublin for three months to visit her sister. At this point, the two sisters living in Dublin. Um, and Dublin was like up and coming. It was all these gorgeous Georgian townhouses being built. It was fashionable. And she got loads of suitors as well. But then she was summoned by her brother to come home. And none of the suitors managed to convince her brother to give them Peg's hand in marriage. Peg's neighbours would basically let her come over whenever she wanted. And they would invite her over loads because... It was a common knowledge that the brother was really horrible. But any time she went, her brother would be waiting and he would physically abuse her for having left the house, even though she'd gotten permission. Oh, God. Yeah, she'd gotten permission from her dad to leave the house. She wasn't doing anything wrong. It was just, it was control. You know, he was so abusive. Mm, That was a poor thing. She went to visit her other sister who lived in Offaly at this point. She's 15. She's of marriageable age. And all these men in uniform, because there was a garrison nearby, Mm -hmm. uh, were flocking her. And she has a lifelong love of men in uniform after this. Understandable. (laughs) (laughs) But like soldiers were poor then. They wouldn't have had a dowry um, and they would have been the wrong class. And Peg's brother's like refusing to give her hand away to any of these guys anyway. And it just shows, I think, the restraints. Like she's in a situation of such privilege and comfort and also how that's going against her because it wasn't an option for her to just get a job to gain her own money or some independence or to just leave her brother's house and work as a you know lady-in-waiting in another house. Like, her class forbade her from that, you know? Um, so she was just really stuck. And I think that's come up in a couple of the episodes we've done, actually, is there's this real conflict between the immense wealth and privilege of these yeah. upper-class women, but also... Mm-hmm. also the control that they lived under was probably much you know much more stringent than mm-hmm. many working class and middle class women it's a real sort of double-edged sword I guess it is and it's that thing of like let's not let people divide us by the class system both were difficult in different ways you know mm. but we're you know as women of the time stuck in it together unfortunately you know yeah so this Rich grocer started chasing her, but he was much older than her and, quote, ill-made, hard feature with the countenance of a baboon. Wow. (laughs) Shabbily dressed, and worse, he wore a full wig. So she's not into him, to say the least. But he was at least friendly and good-tempered. So her father approved to the proposal to the grocer, but Peg had actually fallen in love with another young man. Mm -hmm. He was the most engaging person from my first coming to town and showed me every possible mark of attention and respect. And she was already meeting this guy unchaperoned and in secret. And also in the dating scene back then, there was this whole way that you had to be introduced to a woman via her family and people she knew. Mm -hmm. So he also hadn't been introduced to her in that way. So everything was wrong about how they were going about this. So she hatched a plan to run away with this lover. But her brother-in-law, her sister's husband, ended up chasing them down to an inn with two friends with pistols and dragged Peg away while her lover jumped out the window and ran away. And she was brought home to her brother. Oh no. I know. So at this point she returns to see her younger sister was now emaciated. Her father was really sick. Um, Her sister was emaciated from just the stress of living with the brother Mm -hmm. and soon took to her bed and died. And her brother's, Christopher was his name, got more and more violent. He once beat her and she ended up in bed for 10 days. Oh. So like at this point both the sisters were living in Dublin 
and she was like dad can you just give me money to go see my sisters in Dublin again and she was only there for three months and she got a letter from her younger brother saying I've beaten up Christopher (laughs) and now I'm running the house things are better but unfortunately dad dad is dying and she went back but Christopher soon got back to his old ways and again beat her so badly she ended up in bed for three months oh um, so she left her for her sisters at this point, vowing never to return. I mean, seems fair, honestly. Yeah. And she was like, at this point, her dad had died and she's just resolved to basically enjoying herself. Mm-hmm. So her brother-in-law introduced her to one of her great loves, who's called Mr. Dardis. At first, it was all very upright and traditional. But then secretly, he was knocking on her window at night and they were going on these little nighttime dates. And after a few weeks, he proposed, but he wouldn't have had enough money to be approved. So he's like, I'll marry you once I have more money. Um, Mm -hmm. What happened to Peg happened a lot back then is there's this promise of a proposal from a suitor. There's pressure to give up her virginity and sleep with him. Um, Mm -hmm. She does say, how can I call him a seducer when I met him halfway? So she doesn't blame him in any way about that. Mm. So it was consensual by the sounds it of sounds it. It sounds consensual. She said, what reliance could I have on his honour when I have given up my own? So one day she realised she was pregnant and all of a sudden the promises of marriage dropped off. Mm-hmm. Now, because it would damage Dardis's reputation to marry her. <sighs> of course it would. I know, yeah. Poor woman. Yeah woman girl i mean god how old was she at this point oh god i'd say only 18 maybe so he took her to run away from her family and placed her in a boarding house she liked being in the boarding house because she got to see more of dardis she liked the house but she didn't know at the time it was a base for sex workers something that came from this memoir was that basically if if you even just met up with a guy for a walk unchaperoned you were just lumped in this category the same as sex workers and unmarried wow wow it was that binary Mm -hmm. you know so that's probably the only place he could find that would take in peg you know her family thought she'd committed suicide and even went searching for her body oh god her brother-in-law tracked down the coachman only to be told she's living in this house that is potentially a brothel and they just kind of gave up on her Mm -hmm. she did meet her sister once hiding her bump in a cloak so peg went to the countryside um in drahida to give birth she would have used a public coach which would be like six horses ten passengers and the luggage Mm -hmm. bumpy ride and she ended up sitting next to a distant relative um she spent the whole time stressing and hiding her bump under her cloak Mm -hmm. Um, And she's like, oh, no, I'm just out here doing business for my Mm brother-in-law. She had very little money for this journey and ended up staying with a farmer and his wife. And Mr. Jardis did stand to her financially, but it wasn't much because he wasn't a rich guy himself. She gave birth to a baby girl, probably with a midwife, because solo birthing at the time was illegal. Wait, what? Yeah. Wow. That's bonkers. I know. So she went back to Dublin with a nurse. And she lived with Dardis Mm -hmm. as man and wife in their new lodgings. And he supported her to approach her sister. But both sisters already like kind of rejected her. And that like she sullied the family's name through the elopement, you know. Mm. Peg decided to leave Dardis. It's possible she believed her family would take her back. Um, In a final letter to her dad, she confessed to sinning before him and heaven. And she was put some quotes from the Bible in there about redemption. And her dad said, come home. Um, Mm -hmm. So Peg left her baby with a nurse in Dublin. But when she got back there, her brother refused to let her in the house and gave her money for a cab back. Um, So she's just completely abandoned at this point. Yeah. Her brother is the worst. I know. So it's like she's left Dardis on this thing of like, I can go back to my family and then just turned away. She's completely on her own now. So she stopped off in Kilnagad, which is a border between Wesley and Offaly. And she stayed in a small lodgings and ended up selling her clothes bit by bit. And she now wrote again to her two sisters, who by now had small children themselves, and they refused. And one of them even wrote, if a morsel of bread would save me from death and destruction, I would refuse it to you. Oh, and wow. Just, yeah, the double standard of That's back horrible. then was chastity was like revered for women. While the men Mm. of all classes got to sow their oats, you know. 
That's so horrible, yeah. So she's in this desperate situation of surviving on watered down beef broth and taking some kindness from labourers when two gentlemen approached her one day and she was like, no, she ran away from them into a jeweler's and the jeweler vaguely knew her from before and gave her tea and money for a coach back to Dublin. But on the way back, she bumped into the same two gentlemen and they're like, come into like this tea house with us. And at the time, even that would have been considered inappropriate. Like a woman was just mm-hmm. donned as a sex worker for just even having tea with two men like that she didn't know. So one of them was called Mr. Caulfield and he walked her home and he dropped two guineas into her bosom en route. And he <laughs> promised that if she would allow him, he would become her protector and mm-hmm. she would want for nothing. Uh, but he didn't make a physical advance that night. And even at this point, even through all these hardships, actually, she doesn't express any regret about leaving Mr. Dardis. Mm-hmm. So she took this uh, Thomas Caulfield up on his offer and he got her a new apartment in Dublin, showered her with gifts and attention. And she lived like a well-connected life because he had a pedigree to his name. He, she used to visit him at his house and she said, I lived in a gentle style, unnoticed and unsuspected protection, endearment and plenty. She bore him a son, but she didn't love him, you know, and mm. their affair didn't last a year. It's a survival situation, not a, yeah, exactly. not a love affair. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, even though it was common for men of the aristocracy to do this, marriage would have been out of the question he would be expected to marry a rich heiress that his family approved of, you know? Yeah, so she's she's good enough to be his mistress, but there's no way he's going to marry her. Exactly. So back then, if you had an illegitimate child, it was common to have annuity, which was a written contract between the mistress and the man, and an agreement of a financial arrangement about the child. Mm. So it's so it's kind of 18th century child support, essentially. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it wasn't really legal protection. Do you know what I mean? A man could just decide to stop paying it. We're uncertain what happened to Peg's first child. It was common for courtesans to put a child like out to a family in the countryside and pay them week- weekly for the child's mm-hmm. keep. And if like the father was generous enough, he could do that payment, you know. Peg was like, screw it, and made all these libertine friends, uh, like entertainers, actors, and... Thomas Caulfield, he, like, used to, when they were together, he admonished her for mixing with these people. But then he was, like, cruel enough to desert her, but arrogant enough to still rule her life. You know what I mean? So she's, like, doubled down. She's like, screw you, you know? I'm gonna have a good time. <laughs> so he he then started threatening to cease the annuity mm-hmm. for her child if she continued this behaviour and fulfilled his threat. But even more, this just caused Peg... To go into more and more extravagant mm-hmm. behaviour. And unfortunately her child had a sudden death. And she was plummeted into debt without this annuity. And that's really a common thing for sex workers of that time. And a lot of sex workers today is that oscillation between near destitution and wealth. You know. And like I said, women who lost their virginity, um, seducers, deserters. They were all kind of lumped into that category and would often just re- revert to survival sex work at this point and for peg we see a lot of survival but we also see a lot of she enjoyed herself and we see a lot of she actually really wanted to reject the rules that have been put Mm -hmm. on her you know when peg had money there was a lot of extravagance like the cost of keeping up appearances like the expensive jewelry and the dresses and the lavish apartment and the good hair she said a path sorry a life of dissipation cannot be maintained without some funds And over the next few years, she said, every comfort, convenience and luxury of life I was to enjoy. So at this point, she's destitute. She's not quite destitute, Mm -hmm. but knew she had to find another keeper. And she had a traditional, I know, um, uh, or protector as mm, well. Protector is better. It's still pretty infantilizing, but keeper is really gross. So then she had a traditional formal introduction to her next two lovers, Mr. Jackson and Mr. Lawson. Neither of them had enough money to, like, be her keeper, protector, but, mm-hmm. um, but like, they were great, and they kind of knew about each other, and they were just oh. happy, and I guess they met Peg as a peer, as peers, they, they all had a great time together. Good for her. 
I know. So Peg came across uh, Mr. Leeson. He's her next great love. And this is the guy she took her working name, Mrs. Leeson, from. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was a wealthy English gentleman and he was opulent and he gave her a line of credit. But again, he was pressuring her to give up all her friends, male or female. Mm. You know what? That's a dating pattern I still see today. It's like, wait a minute, you chose me because I'm fun and outrageous. And then you start dating and it's like, I want you to like tone all that fun and outrageousness down now. Yeah. It's like, now you want to put me in a cage and keep me like a fucking pet or something. Exactly. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh, no, it's horrible. It's so misogynistic. It's gross. Yeah, so he's like, stop being fun outrageous. And she's like, yeah, sure, but still keep seeing like all her several other lovers. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's hot. Um. <laughs> Mr. Leeson never married, which meant he could live with Peg. And he was in the 1785 Hibernian list of eligible peers. Huh. So he was obviously a bit hot as well. So she did not marry him, she just took his name? Yeah. Okay. There is a precedent for that throughout history with couples who couldn't marry for whatever reason or yeah. didn't want to marry yeah, for whatever fair. reason. That is, yeah, that is a known thing. So, you know, Peg says he was kind and good nature and demonstrative of his regard, but he did try to keep her sequestered. Um, He set her up in lovely lo lodgings. And this is very like the gold cage, yeah, you know, absolutely. gave her a life of luxury and everything she wanted except freedom. Yeah. But he's suspicious that she's still seeing all these other guys. And he even like sacked her dressmaker, like dressmakers were famous for passing notes from mistresses to lovers. It's all very Bridgerton. I was just thinking about that, yeah. So then he was like, I know, we need to move to the country. Of course. So they moved to Kildare, and this is where, like, aristocracy would have hunting lodges and stuff, but otherwise there was really nothing to do. And at first she loved it, because it's like a life of luxury. And they hunted together. They, you know, had home entertainment, like singing, piano, viola, dancing and playing cards. And, you know, she didn't have to bother with domestic duties except for, like, planning menus whenever she wanted. Mm -hmm. And kind of all she had to do was dress attractively and make sure her hair was okay and entertain Leeson. But Leeson then had to go back to Dublin. It's unsure if this was personal or political or what. And he rented a house on the outskirts of town to try and, like, have her nearby but still avoid her old friends. And they lived quietly there for a year. And she does write that in this time he does consider making her his wife. Huh. But she's still like, I'm not falling for that again, you know, after the first Mr. Dardis guy. Mm -hmm. So she was still seeing Mr. Lawson and Mr. Jackson. She says, Stolen pleasures are generally held to be very sweet. And despite his vigilance... I sometimes enjoyed them to compensate for the external constraint I was forced to assume. And that external constraint isn't just Mr. Leeson. It is also like the gender roles of the time mm -hmm. that she specifies. Yeah. Again, she really reminds me of Gronia Whale in a lot of ways. She's very charming. So even Mr. Leeson's manservant started helping her continue these affairs. And he would watch at the windows for Mr. Leeson coming home. <laughs> Wow, okay. And that's a theme that will appear here again and again. People loved her, mm -hmm. you know? So she says, How can a woman be a drunk, a scandal monger, and a cheat, but still remain virtuous if she is chaste? So she has lots of these opinions about, like, basically virginity was the most important thing. And she's like, there's worse things I could be doing, basically. Mm -hmm. There was a publication... Um, called A Modest Defense of Chastity, published in 1726, which was very popular. And that just said all sorts of stupid things about a virgin being a better woman Ugh, or something. Of course it did. Ugh, look it up yourselves. Ugh, gross. <laughs> Mr. Leeson bought a new house in Dublin just for Peg, and he wanted to set her up in it. But he was very smitten, but he was smitten by this reformed character, like this... Almost like this woman he rescued and made a proper woman of, you know? And liked the version of her who complied with his terms and gave him his, her full attention. He gave her a bill of credit for a merchant, whatever money she wanted. And when she was in the countryside, she loved having access to fresh milk. So he even bought a field with two cows, mm -hmm. you know, so she could have fresh milk in the city. She was grateful, but like, again, didn't really love him. Yeah. She does claim in, the, in her memoir he proposed marriage, but she was unwilling to sacrifice freedom for security. 
it doesn't sound like she had all that much freedom anyway. Oh, that's totally true. But obviously, I appreciate it at that time. If she gets married to him, then she she does become essentially legally his property. Whereas if they're not married, she's always got that ability to get out. Yeah, and I can understand considering the men she grew up around, why she would always want an escape. Plan. Yeah, that seems entirely you know? fair. So this new house was built for her, but she's like, oh, I don't want to move in there. It's still a bit damp and stuff. But Leeson had to go back to Kildare and his suspicions were mounted and he asked a merchant to spy on Peg but the merchant was also in love with Peg (laughs) (laughs) wow and possibly exchanging some sexual favours for his silence was anyone not in love with this woman yeah I know it's it's, she just sounds amazing And like even the people who owned the place he was renting for her would cover for her once Mr. Leeson came back from Kildare, went to her house and knocked and the people that lived there were like, oh no, she's not here. She must be at the merchant. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the merchant like, oh, where's Peg? And the merchant managed this time to send a message to Peg. And she snuck home before Mr. Leeson popped over again. And the merchant kept Mr. Leeson as long as possible to let Peg sneak home. And he's like, look, to Mr. Leeson, he said, you told the owners of the house to not say Peg lived there to anyone to keep her away from these gentlemen visitors. That's why they told you she's not home, but she is actually Uh home. And so Mr. Leeson goes back and he's like, oh, Peg is home. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Peg wrote, polygamy was not wrong in its own nature, but merely as it was a great difference between what was evil in itself and what was evil by human prohibition. I look upon marriage merely as a human institution calculated chiefly in order to legitimize children and to oblige parents to bring them up and provide for them, to ascertain the descent of property and to bind two persons together, even after they might be disgusted with and heartily tired of one another. Huh. It's pretty fucking forward thinking. It is, actually, yeah. In the end, though, another friend of Leeson's kind of ratted Peg out and... Mr. Leeson cut off Peg's credit and sent a long letter to her and cut her off without any more contact. Peg says, I was rather more distressed from the loss of his purse than his person. (laughs) (laughs) Oh God, that's spectacular. So in 1783, at like at this point, Peg is a successful courtesan. She started especially being visited by noble lords in the 1760s on her way up to that point. This guy called Buck Lawless she fell in love with. That's a great name. Yes. He'd recently come into some money and property. It wasn't huge, but it was enough to take Peg into his protection. Mm -hmm. And he bought her and put her name on the title of a nice house that she would later rent out. And it's like financial stability. And her period with him is the most stable period of her life where she has shelter. And she did love him. She did love Buck Lawless. Um, So over the next five and a half years, she had five more children. Her daughter from Dardis isn't mentioned anymore, but her relationship with Lawless became tempestuous. She was faithful, but he became suspicious. And she said, if at a play I merely accepted an orange or returned a salute from a gentleman, he immediately insisted on our return home. But he was also annoyed when she spoke to female friends. Whereas he himself was going out and was often like showing all the signs of being unfaithful himself, like not coming home at night. So he's super possessive and also a giant hypocrite. Mm -hmm. She tells this story as proof she was kind of like faithful to Buck. In this time, there was a Captain Benjamin Matthews came back into her life. She'd known him before. He sent her a diamond ring and she returned it. And he presumed that was because it wasn't enough. So he sent her two diamond rings. Oh, wow. And she returned it. So he's like, oh, shit. Sent her two diamond rings with a wad of money. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) But she's like, no, like, I love Lawless and I'm not doing sex work anymore, mm. you know? So despite the fact that their relationship had become physically violent. Oh, no. Yeah, to the point that she lost one of her babies in pregnancy from his beatings. But again, we see this thing that still happens today. She saw it as her fault for being too high spirited. Oh. oh, God, that's so sad. Oh, my God, the poor yeah. thing. And at the time, laws only protected married women from that of course they did it was just like you know if you're in a relationship with someone and you're not married then it you know it's just like you're doing sex work and violence comes with sex work so you're not protected you know rape had a capsule punishment at the time but it was rarely enforced Mm -hmm. because it was like why would we 
harm a man so much for the sake of a tarnished woman. Like, if a woman was raped, her parents or husband could take legal action and the reward would go to them. Right, it was viewed as a... Ugh. It was kind of viewed as a property crime rather than a crime against a yeah. human. Just yeah, that was the case in many places, unfortunately. It's really sickening. So, Lawless, on top of, like, staying out all night and showing these signs of cheating, his finances were now also dwindling and he was pawning what they had. And unfortunately, another sickness hit the house. And all of Peg's children died. Oh God! The last, all of them? yeah, the last to survive was a little boy who was being looked after in another house, but he eventually also died, and she believed those deaths to be the result of divine like punishment. Oh, I know it's awful. Oh God, that's so sad. So this is the part of the show where we shout out our wonderful supporters on Patreon. So we have a tier on our Patreon which is called Co-Conspirator, which is anyone who's giving us 10 euros and above every month. And we said that we would give them a shout out on the show to just say how fabulous they are and how much we appreciate them. So Grace, do you want to tell us about our lovely Co-Conspirators? Shout out to Wazen Dear. You are very dear to our Wazes. <laughs> And my beautiful friend, Charlotte Hadley, I love you so much. You're an absolute babe. Oh, thank you both so much. And if you would like to get your name on the show, then head over to patreon.com slash women vs everything and support us at the 10 euro a month level or above. Even a dollar, baby. So, Lawless, here's another way he's a prick, eventually decided to go to America, but he was aware... Peg's only option would be to find another protector or work in a brothel so he just kind of kept it secret from her uh, and he's like no I'm just leaving for a few days to visit my uncle and left letter with a friend who'd brought it to Peg the next day mm -hmm. um, and it was basically his family said they would disinherit him and cut him off if he stayed in Ireland or if he brought Peg with him so she got broken up with by a letter the day after he left I hate this man I know I hate all these men yeah this poor woman, oh my god. So just so many people who have used her and traumatized her and oh so sad. So sad. Yeah, and she got really like, you know, understandably upset and into a depression. So a doctor advised her to go to the countryside and it was there she gave birth to a daughter, her eighth child, just before she turned thirty. Oh my god. Um so even though she's still grieving lawless she knows she needs a new protector mm -hmm. and she rented out the house that she shared with Lawless while she lived somewhere else and she started settling back into a life of freedom and going out more and making up for like all the time she was faithful to Lawless for no reason uh -huh. and yep. because she'd been away for a while she was now like a new face around town she was attractive and like shiny and new again but she resisted advances for a while and um, you know the guy who sent her all the diamond rings Matthew? Yes he offered to take her to America looking for Lawless if she agreed to marry Matthews if they didn't find him. Oh, wow. <sighs> wow. I mean... Good Lord. She she has this thing for a while where she's just like, no, like, I'm not settling for any rich man if I don't love him, you know? Uh, so 18 months later, she was just like, fuck this Lawless guy and embarked on a new affair with Reverend Thomas Lambert. He had pursued her earlier, but now she's like, now I'm ready. <laughs> and um, supported her again in a very luxurious manner. And she soon was with child. And this was the last child she had. Mm -hmm. And again, sent away to live. Child number nine, right? With a nurse. Yeah. Um, she doesn't write much of her children, but she does write of them fondly. And at this point, she's like on the cusp of turning like truly full time professional sex worker so she gets in touch with a friend who's sally hayes a fellow sex worker and a fated bell together they open their first house of entertainment in drahada street it's like not called a brothel it's like a house of entertainment would also have hand-picked sex workers very classically beautiful and seductive relatively learned that would be up to date with gossip and news as part of their job they would go out to shows or races and then invite 
men back for a party. There would be spectacular food and champagne and conversation. And she had musicians on constant patronage as well. Mm. So with this house of entertainment, Peg got lots of money and gifts. And like even her own mattress was a gift from someone. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, it was like all like newest technology and like mattress you know like it had springs in it and everything Mm -hmm. so she's like screw love and long-term protectors I have my freedom now she has a great time and after four years of silence she hears from Lawless and he's in Cork Uh and he's like come see me and she's like no screw you you ditched me right no no no, I wish she said I was greatly changed the time was passed when I'd have almost given one of my eyes for a letter from him Oh. oh sweetie But Sally encouraged her because Sally said, hey, he might have money from his trip to America. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we already have a carriage, so it's not going to be any expense for us to just go. So it's like, okay, but I'm bringing my girlfriends. Mm -hmm. So on seeing Law, she said, I did not look upon him with the same eyes as formerly. His neglect to crime no woman can bear had penetrated deep into my heart. So she let him know I was entirely my own mistress and accountable to no one for my conduct or my actions. But, um partied on his money for several days (laughs) (laughs) good honestly given what he did that seems like entirely fair yeah and he's all like oh i tried to send letters but i couldn't because of the war but she knew that was a lie because his family had gotten letters from him for god's sake Uh uh-huh so after a month lawless was well and truly rinsed of money so she went back to dublin (laughs) but now she's pregnant oh no oh no with her I know, with her ninth child, which is her sixth child with Lawless. And for as long as she could throughout the pregnancy, she continued to entertain clients at her house. Like, it seems like like sex work was really commonplace back then. There was one newspaper suggested there was 74 brothels in Dublin. Yeah. In 1766. I, l- I learned a little bit about... And 300 a few years later. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a lot of people were very, very poor at that time, and... For many women, that sort of was the only option that they really had. It was really a case of survival for many, many women. There was a lot of disease. A lot of the men who were frequenting these, this source calls them bawdy houses, I guess, I guess brothels. A lot of the men were, Mm. were violent and the police didn't really do anything to protect the women at all. There was this particular area in the centre of Dublin where many of the brothels were concentrated along these sort of alleyways, and there was this one area called Wine Tavern Street, which was specifically called that because of the large number of brothels, taverns and gambling houses in the area. <laughs> and by the quays in particular, it was mm. notorious because there were, there were brothels there that the sailors coming off the boats would frequent. There's this woman called Mary Brown who was convicted of brothel keeping in 1751 and she was sentenced to be carried in a cart through the street. She was quite popular and the police were very corrupt and somehow she ended up being allowed to hide in the floor of the cart so she was out of public view. Well, yeah, because the police were her fucking customers. Right, absolutely. It's the, the hypocrisy is, is amazing. So, of course, everyone who was involved in the legal process was a man. And it, it was this real conflict because, you know, a lot of these men were paying these women for sex and yet they still had these views that modesty and chastity was becoming for women. So it was this really really conflicting moral standard. There was something called the Disorderly House Act of 1751, which was the, the act that brothel keepers were often charged under. There's a part of that that reads, The multitude of places of entertainment for the lower sort of people is another great cause of thefts and robberies, as they are thereby tempted to spend their small substance in riotous pleasures, and in consequence are put on unlawful methods of supplying their wants and renewing their pleasures. How terrible. There was a requirement for certain businesses to have a licence. So the, the law reads, Any house, room, garden or other place kept for public dancing, music or other public entertainment of the like kind needed a licence. And those that didn't have a licence were classed as, quote, disorderly houses. Oh, okay. So a lot of people who were running brothels would hide it behind another legitimate business. There was one woman who hid it behind a haberdasher's shop. There was another one who ran it that ran it behind the facade of a china shop. Yeah, this, that's mentioned in this book, actually, that one. It's happening a lot, and it's happening sort of fairly out, out in the open, but it is, it is kind of technically illegal, and people are being prosecuted um, under these laws. 
not, that might be a good point actually to go into like the gang violence in Dublin. Yeah, I learned a little bit about that too. Do you want me to go into it? Yes, please. In Georgian and Victorian Dublin, there was two main criminal gangs and they were called the Liberty Boys and the Ormond Boys. And the Liberty Boys were mostly Protestant weavers from the northern side of Dublin and the Ormond Boys were Catholic butchers from the south side of Dublin. Yeah. And they hated each other. So there was almost every day there were street fights between these gang members. There was one in 1790 that was so severe that it shut down the city down to commerce for two full days. Jesus Christ. And of course, this was in the press a lot of the time. And they were always sort of speculating on the reasons for this, this animosity. The earliest report dates from 1749. And as I said, there was a a serious riot in 1790. So this has been going on for pushing 40 years at least. Jesus Christ. And it was really, you know, scary, violent stuff that that was going on. Did you find anything about the Pinking Dandies? These were awful men. This gang that called itself the Pinking Dindies. And pinking apparently means stabbing or jabbing. And most of the info on this came from a book by someone called J.D. Herbert. The book was called Irish Varieties for the Last 50 Years, written from Recollections, and that was published in 1836. And what's interesting about this Pinking Dindies gang is that they largely came from the from the upper class, yeah. whereas gang violence typically was more rooted in lower socioeconomic groups. When you think of gang violence, it's often very much associated with sort of poverty and that kind of thing. But actually, this was a group of affluent, wealthy men. Herbert describes them as imposing appearance being handsome and well made in general they would just roam the streets and a direct quote from the source they say these wealthy men would assail passengers in the street to levy contributions or perhaps take a lady from her protector and many females were destroyed by that lawless banditti yeah so disgusting rich boys and yeah you know who it reminded me of you know those What's those rich... Um... Oh my god, the Bullingdon Club. That's it. Yes! The Club. It is like the 1700s Bullingdon Club. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. Totally. Mm. So in 1779, these guys were just on a normal night out being assholes. And mm-hmm. among them was Richard Crosby, who went on to be Ireland's first aeronaut. And can I just say, the amount of famous men that are mentioned in this memoir as Peg's clients. Like, literally. Really? Like, this one founded the banks. This one, uh-huh. I mean, oh God, I think it's like maybe like women's invisible labor again. You know? yep. like where it's just like this country was built by men that frequented sex workers. So these guys just decided to like attack Peg's house at the end of the night when like she closed up for business for no reason. Mm-hmm. And sadly, Peg was beaten up. <gasps> oh no. To unconsciousness. <gasps> And they trashed the house. Oh, God, that's awful. Neighbours called watchmen. And the neighbours joined the watchmen then to try and beat up these vandals, which, again, like, so Peg's neighbours loved her. Mm -hmm. Um, And sheriffs arrived with the military. And, again, the military loved Peg. Like, she was, you know, most of the high-ups in the military were, who were also then the judges and magistrates, were customers of hers, which is, I think, why she was never tried for anything. Mm-hmm. So the dandies dispersed. Three weeks later, this is horrible. Peg's baby was stillborn with a broken leg. Oh. Mm. oh God, and her okay. two year old daughter also died shortly later, which Peg puts down to dying in the consequence of the fright. This is really sad. Mm. But yeah. in the two weeks before that, she was up the next day repairing the house with the military guards protecting her, you know? Uh huh. So her quotas. Thus, these magnanimous warriors actually murdered two helpless infants, bruised and maltreated their defenseless mother, destroyed the furniture of the house, terrified a whole neighbourhood, and wounded some of the watch for fun. How void their hearts must be of true humanity and bravery. It's just senseless violence for the sake of senseless violence on people that they perceive are defenseless. There have been um, one case before where a sex worker like sued against these people and won. Not necessarily these people, but sued against, sued against vandals. So because the police force was really inadequate back then, it didn't really exist. Mm-hmm. They only caught one member of the gang, which was Richard Crosby, who was prosecuted and charged with the murder of a child in utero. And that carried a death penalty. So Peg was pressured to drop the murder charge. 
<sighs> and she um, something we see about her again is she is very forgiving to the point it is a detriment to her but she kept the prosecution to her home the jury found Crosby guilty and he was jailed and fined but he was out again by the time Peg pursued for damages any other recognisable gang members were also summoned but they fled Dublin mm-hmm. Peg eventually forgave Crosby and shook his hand before his first balloon ride which is what well, he's famous for his first aeronautic travel yeah it just seems of the time you know violence was considered part of a man's makeup mm-hmm. so it's just like not a big deal for her to forgive him yeah and she's also very wily I also think it was you know he was probably friends with lots of people that would be prospective clients and might have suited her to keep him on her good side, you know. <laughs> There's another story where some, some soldiers came uninvited to one of her parties and Sally Hayes took a horse whip and chased them out. <laughs> yes, this is the correct way to respond when people show up uninvited. So she's now in her 30s. She's unlikely to get a protector or earn as much as she did in her youth. So she's looking more at expanding her business you know and her life as an entrepreneur as as opposed to a sex worker this is a really fun story of how much people loved her there was a well-known actress in the area who had been bad-mouthing her peg confronted the lady peg shouted after her and referred to that actress's children as bastards even though she was married to a quite well-to-do man and that's enough for that actress to bring peg to court for slander but at the time the court system was made up of a petty jury which would be tradespeople shopkeepers and everything Mm-hmm. And Peg and Peg's enterprise <laughs> was their most loyal customers. <laughs> <laughs> so they all found her not guilty. <laughs> uh huh. Of course they did. Also, the actress didn't live full time in Dublin, and people really looked down on people that would like come to work in Dublin but then make their money and fuck off, you know? Right. Uh huh. Peg was also Catholic Irish, which, again, people just loved her for that. Peg was still in mourning for having for many years for her two babies, despite having a public life. Mm. She remained in communication for with Lawless, who's now in London, but she refused to join him because she's now like immersed in like being her own mistress and all the earthly pleasures. And at one point, she's actually sending Lawless money. Oh wow! A lot of her customers were army superiors, and she's trying to get Lawless a post in Dublin. Peg eventually decides to leave Ireland and try her luck in London. She moved into lodgings with Lawless over there. Lawless had a mistress of course he did (laughs) so Peg said to think that he had formed such a connection at a time when he was writing to me in the most affectionate terms and urging me to come to him hurt me greatly so she caught him off completely at this point but she didn't want to go back to Dublin so soon so she stayed in her lodgings in London for a bit and had a great time she hired a companion and she's well known for like supporting other women who'd fallen on rough times So the companion that she hired was an Irish woman who'd been kicked out by her husband and they would just have a great time partying till dawn, going to plays, dancing till midnight. Um, She's one of the few sex workers to not report an affair with the prince in the area at the time. But she does say that there was once he was travelling on his horse and he motioned for her to like clear the road for him and she refused and shouted, there is room sufficient, there is one half of the road for you and I have as much right to the other half of the road as you or anyone else. Oh, Oh my god, what a badass. That's awesome. Then she galloped alongside his (laughs) carriage, glaring at him after shouting at him. (laughs) That's amazing. Um, She hit some bad luck in London. She got pleuretic fever, probably made worse by the fact that she got some symptoms, but still stayed out dancing all night. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not the best choice. Yeah, she, so she ended up in bed for a month with that. And when she recovered, she realized her employees had stolen a bunch of her loads of diamond brooches, a gold watch and a trunk of clothing. Oh, oh no. And that's again, like Peg is so trusting to her detriment. It's not the last time that she will hire servants and people who are down on their luck and they end up kind of betraying her. That's also something that was that was said about Louisa Gold, actually, if you remember from her episode, was was people said yeah. that she her downfall was that she was too trusting for her own good. And 1780 she went back to Dublin. Her friend and like co-owner of her entertainment house, Sally Hayes, and a friend who's also a sex worker called Mal Hall were both delighted to see her. She was sp- like sporting the new look. She's the first ever worn in Dublin to wear bell-hooped petticoats. 
and there's really fun stories of them like them being banned from some balls because <laughs> they were so big they would sweep things off the table when women were walking past oh my god style goals they'd have to enter a room sideways <laughs> Lawless is still writing Peg and his letters are a great example of gaslighting. His letters are basically saying, I regret it and I'm sorry, so you're mean for not letting it go. Oh yeah. no, 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 not okay. But Peg is back from London, so all the gentlemen callers are like, oh my god, you're back. And she's like just surrounded by banknotes and wine and friends and she rented an expensive house with land at the back, which she turned into an elegant garden which uh, she lived with another lover there for a year, but there's no major mention of him. Okay, so another notorious incident for Peg is these two musicians, Signor San Giorgio and Signor Carnavale, were Italian that came to perform an Italian comic opera in Dublin. They decided to ban courtesans from the theatre or anyone with a questionable virginity status. I'm sorry, what? So Peg... I know! What? Oh my god. So Peg is and her friends are used to like being able to afford the best seats in the house of the theatre. And now all of a sudden they go to see this and there's two bully boy bouncers who don't let them in. Wow. So Peg's like with a friend and judge. They booked the best seat in the house. And the bouncers restrained her, but she fought back to the point that the bouncer had to like pick her up, which I just <laughs> I'm imagining in a bell hoop skirt. Amazing. The mental images he, are just great. He put her, I know. So he put her down. She turned around. She slapped him across the face. She's like, get Senior Carnavale. I want to talk to him immediately. But like, she's just kind of sent away. But then four noblemen clients drop by and she's like, you know, ranting about this. How dare they? So one of these clients is a well-known barrister. He's like, I got you, girl. He helps her procure warrants for assault and robbery. Huh. So assault for lifting her up and robbery because she had a paid ticket, which they took from her. Wow. Good for him. We like this guy. I know. So now she goes to the theatre with four bouncers of her own who hauled these two guys uh, away in their carriage and Carnavale. They dumped Carnavale outside the front of the prison went back and got the other two bouncers. So Peg turns around to all these people waiting in the lobby for the show to start. Curtsies and goes, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely sorry to deprive you of the pleasure you may expect from tonight's performance, but I have Mr. Carnavale, the first fiddle to Newgate, and I'm now sending two of his domestics after him. <laughs> and she just left, leaving people absolutely flabbergasted, and it was in the papers the next day. Brilliant. And uh, they also managed to charge the bouncers with despoiling her because she was missing an earring after the scuffle. <laughs> oh my God, this is the best thing ever. I love it. I know. So she's just praised by men and women for her spirit. So she shows up to the opera the next week with two gentlemen friends who were poor but liked to kick up a dust. She said they were the kind of bucks that though they were always well dressed, they seldom had a shilling in their pocket. Um, and the box office guy told her Mr. Carnavale had actually given her the freedom of the house. And uh, the two thugs that were bouncers of Carnavale's were hiding because they were afraid of being beaten up again. <laughs> <laughs> so she dropped the prosecution. <laughs> That's again, we see with Peg, like she seeks justice, but she'll drop the prosecution if it's served. Uh-huh, yeah. And also this ability to mould her image is exceptional. She's got this humble yet fiery persona in the papers. Yeah. So obviously this helps business flourish. It's the 1780s and she's living in splendour and she's having a great time and she's seeing all these haughty totty people. Mm -hmm. And um, she decides to throw a masquerade ball despite the fact they're banned to the public. Why are they banned? That's so weirdly specific. I know, because I think it's just, it was associated with all this debauchery. Uh -huh. And people were trying to dissuade her for a fortnight before the event. But she's like, nope. She's like, the law won't come for me because I've invited them all to the party. <laughs> <laughs> so this ball had like 200 tickets. It was great. It was by 6pm. The street was packed and there was a large crowd and someone threw a stone through the window. So herself and Sally made an appearance on the balcony and just kind of greeted the adoring public, which satiated the mob <laughs> enough that like the ball just went ahead. 
Amazing. And this was the first of many of her masquerade balls and she would attend as Cleopatra, Diana the Huntress and the Virtue Chastity. <laughs> Brilliant. The Duke of Leinster had her like reserve her bed for him at that ball and he didn't show up, which is fine because I'm sure she got paid anyway. But yeah, she's living the life at this point. That's awesome. So 1782, her soft spot for army men rears its head again and she fell in love with a soldier called Robert Gorman. So she retires again from sex work because she says he was almost constantly with me and then I despised all the rest of mankind. Gorman's father disapproved and tried to prevent him from spending all his money by giving him strict rules and they had to come up with a really weird routine as a result where Robert would have dinner with his dad, go to peg for the night and race home for the morning to be like, oh yeah, I just woke up in my own bed, dad, have breakfast with his dad and then have lunch with Peg. Wow. And, you know, it sounds like he took a page out of Peg's book. He went down to the kitchen and made friends with servants and gave them loads of wine and money until they were devoted to him and lied for him as well. But they were caught. He was caught by his dad. So then he just stormed off and stayed with Peg for three weeks. <laughs> and Fair enough. sadly... Sadly, Mr. Gorman Sr. sent Robert for a stint in the East Indies, which resulted in another tearful farewell for Peg. Mm. Um, his ship was held up in London, so she travelled against his wishes to London and they holidayed in Portsmouth for a while. And she she calls him the second man I ever loved, oh. the first being lawless. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he travelled to India with a miniature portrait of Peg. And wrote to her at every stop. And he just seemed to very obviously miss her, mm. you know? Yeah. This is brilliant. In this time, a group of soldiers came to her house with the intention of robbing her. And claimed she was hiding a deserter. While she's arguing with them, she sent her servant to the barracks. And she's friends with all the top brass. So the top brass shut down the barracks gate and did a head count. And out of the group of men who were missing from the barracks during the head count, there was 11 so she was like asked to identify which were the men that harassed her out of the 11. So she only identified one, which was the rudest one. And he was court-martialed and sentenced to 100 lashes. Oh, wow. He sent begging letters, asking her for forgiveness and even sending his wife. And Peg contacted the colonel and asked his release from prison. And various soldiers called for weeks afterwards, thanking her. And again, it's a thing where... She's showing mercy, but also it's good for business. This kind of like horror with a heart persona, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like an example of Peg lifting up other women is, you know, a girl came to see her who'd been sent to live with her old aunt. But the old aunt actually just used her as a slave and the poor girl was working her fingers to her bone, living in a small room, which was locked and just giving food on a plate. Mm. And oh God. she ran away to Peg to beg Peg like can I be your servant you know like like mm -hmm. she knew about Peg's childhood so Peg actually instead brought the girl back to her parents and scolded the girl's father and told him that if he didn't treat his daughter better she'd publish what he'd done for the whole city wow and the memoir is peppered with Peg helping other women giving them refuge financial help recruiting and mentoring them into sex work and the memoir as such is also a documentation of how society was failing women and the sexual underworld in which women were prominent and giving their individual stories. She also gave like lots of women shelter from the law. She also had some good boundaries, like she took women to court if they owed her money. She sacked another sex worker for being too vulgar and indiscreet. Uh, because Peg's like house of entertainment was like upper, upper, upper class. Like it was the nobility, you know. And she was also part of the Protestant Union, uh, which had set a kitty up for women who fell on hard times. Yeah, wow. There's <laughs> another party where she was upstairs with a captain, Henry Monk, and he was like, go on, try on my uniform, it'll be so hot. <laughs> and she looked great in it, I, miss I assume. So she walked out of the bedroom, like, wearing it to the party. And one of the other officers, a Mr. Hunt, started haranguing her, like, how dare you wear this uniform, la la la. She wrote a letter of complaint about him and he was court-martialed. Behaving this way, it was that guy, Mr. Hunt, was the one who was disgraced for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so a previous lover came back into Peg's life around 1783, cutting him, and he asked her to move in with him. She compromised. She said, I'll spend four days at your house and three days at mine, seeing whoever I please. Seems fair. And his letters from the time are affectionate, professing love. He also had a miniature portrait of himself made for her. 
and uh, when he was stationed outside Dublin she turned down the invite but he continued to write for many years and he again really really loved her and wore a miniature portrait of her on his finger and he said I constantly wear it on my finger and kiss it 100 times a day Aww. that's cute I know that's cute. so these are these are two good men that unfortunately were stationed overseas you know she's now in her 40s but she's at the height of her profession so she built a new house in Pitt Street just because the old one was gone shabby and it became the most elite establishment of its kind in Dublin again by this time she's only seeing nobility the wealthiest men in town She's gotten enough money to invest in business and she's kind of like the queen of Ireland, basically. She said, I still increase in celebrity and was esteemed the first woman in Ireland in my line, visited by nobles and gentlemen of the first rank in the kingdom. And one of the most famous men she saw was Charles Manners. He was a fourth Duke of Rutland and he was made Viceroy of Ireland. Oh, wow. And this was all before he was 30. So he comes to her place and <laughs> the story of how he met her is really funny. Like, Peg and her friends are just having tea and next thing there's, like, armed guards outside protecting the entrance and he just, like, enters, like, can you see me now? And he ends up staying with Peg for 16 hours mm -hmm. uh, forgetting about his armed guards outside. <laughs> so Peg had to, like, oops, keep sending food and alcohol out to her guards. <laughs> out to his guards. He was just obsessed with Peg. He loved her and he put her on the government pension list under a fake name. <laughs> And his wife was quite unfazed by his affairs, which is just as well because the newspapers were full of news about the two of them. The, another like very infamous night for Peg was she went to theatre and the papers were just full of the stories of her and this viceroy. People in the theatre shouted in front of the viceroy and his wife, Peg, who lay with you last night? And she said, manners, you blackguards, manners, you know. So in 87, Rutland died of liver disease. He had like a really lavish life. Um, mm -hmm. and at this point Peg could turn away strangers without an introduction from fellow no nobles to her house of entertainment there's so many stories of her absolutely refusing rejecting and humiliating well-dressed men who tried to like bribe their way into the house oh, wow. without an introduction yeah in 1784 Sally Hayes died sadly likely due to venereal disease and Peg also was ill on and off for a long time, likely with the same issue. Lawless is still writing to her throughout this whole time, you know? So there was the Dublin Police Act in 1786, and that kind of temporarily um, made the police force more official and stronger. Peg had the only run-in with the law during this time, where she was walking to Mulhall's house after a show, and respectable women didn't walk at night, basically. Uh -huh. Peg was accompanied by her foot servant, but that still wasn't enough. So the police approached her and said, like, where are you going? And she's like, what's it to you? And um, wouldn't answer them. So they insisted she come to the station. And she even pulled the, do you know who I am card with them. <laughs> of course she did. And she said, you'll pay dirty for your conduct. The police now was likely angling for a bribe, but she wasn't having it. So while she's brought to the police station, the footmen ran off to get her friends in high places. And officers came along and just sent Peg home. The policeman lost his job came to Peg's house the next day begging forgiveness and she took pity on him and helped him regain his job. Oh, wow. God, she was so nice. She was nice and powerful. We meet another great love of hers, a guy called Barry Elverton Jr. He offered to marry her and he was rich. He stood to inherit money and a title. Mm -hmm. His father was an Irish judge and politician and she refused him a lot and professed to despise him the first time that she met oh, wow. him. Wow. But... He pursued her and um, he proposed to Peg in the presence of a friend and they even like ran and got a priest really quickly to marry mm -hmm. them in the presence of three witnesses and the newspapers erupted and ballots were composed about this story but the union wasn't to last because the Elverton basically wanted the chase, not the oh, catch. Of course. And he ran into de debts and was a bit of a never do well. So Peg said... I looked upon that connection with such loathing that for a very trifling consideration, I was ready to relinquish every claim I had on young hopeful. And she accepted 500 guineas to absolve the marriage. So she used that money to go on a trip away with her friend. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, what else do you do when you get handed 45 grand to dump your husband? So unfortunately, when she came back to Pitt Street, the house was wrecked after this mm -hmm. trip. Her boarders she'd taken in 
caused drunken riots and had sold off the furniture. So again, she was just too trusting with some of the people she yeah. took in. So Peg literally said, I'm too old for this shit. She'd been in the business for 30 years upwards and she's now in her 50s. And she kind of knew like this couldn't re- continue and it was time to uh-huh. retire. She owned land and she spent 500 guineas built, having a house built mm-hmm. on it while weaning herself off the kind of difficulties of her life and also like still squeezing every last strap of fun out of it. Of course. She took in another companion, Fanny, whose surname I forgot, but Fanny eventually edits the first two of Peg's memoirs. So many customers that would come to Peg's house would often be drunk arriving and more drunk leaving. So they often forgot to pay. And she kept a ledger sometimes with this description of them because she didn't know their names. So like she'd like Mr. Whiskers and like Captain Longnose are two names from the ledger. <laughs> Spectacular. And the ones, the ones she could track d- down, she could sue. And 1793, her kind of plan to retire from this life was reinforced after seeing two friends dumped by their noblemen. Mm -hmm. And she had a strong moment of repentance, dreading, quote, a whore's death. I took a horrible retrospect of the course I had run and all my past life. And she started a course of penance and reformation. She wrote to two friends, Mrs. S and Betsy O'Falvey, who advised her to leave Ireland to start afresh. But she didn't really like that idea. And she's like, even if starting afresh means getting married or succumbing to Catholicism, I'm not interested mm-hmm. in it, you know? Yep. She was very spiritual, but like found all of the like mainstream religions out there to, um, she talked about loving nature and finding spirituality in nature, which is again, very forward thinking, you know? It is, yeah. She hadn't really made provisions. Um, we don't know how she thought she'd make a living at this point because her money's ru- like running out and she sold the house in Pitt Street and the furniture and moved to Black Rock where she'd had the new house built. And she hoped to live out her retirement in ease and independence. She hit on the idea of writing her memoirs because she had a friend in printing and she printed rough drafts of her first two memoirs, sent this to the areas of men that were named for owing her money mm-hmm. and they almost all paid her back before she got the memoirs officially published. Before she got the memoirs officially published and took their names out. But she squandered the money once her debts were paid. She published the first two volumes in 1795, earning £500, but she also squandered this. And bit by bit, she pawned all her luxury items until the house was nearly empty and they couldn't afford breakfast or fuel for the fire. We see, again, the loyalty and people loved her. Like, visitors, like, neighbours would come and bring her gifts and money. Mm -hmm. Previous footmen and previous servants. One footman who Peg stood to when he was sick in her employment even cried upon seeing the state that, like, she was Mm -hmm. in and gave her a quarter of his wages. Wow. And gifted her pens and parchment to continue her writing. So she is finally arrested and it's for debt and a debt of £15 to the local shop. That was a lot of money back then. So she's taken to a sponging house, which is basically like, you know, a workhouse. And she was bumped into an old lover, Purcell, who didn't recognise her at all. And he came on to her and even though she turned him down, he said, well, if you won't share my bed, then you must share my purse. And he still stood to her and friends donated... Mm -hmm. So she wrote again to a lot of men who were indebted to her and some repaid. She made a companion in the workhouse called Betsy, who died in the time Peg knew her while they were still in the workhouse. And a footman who worked for the sponging house paid for Betsy's funeral. Mm-hmm. So again, we see like Peg is such a lovely, endearing yeah, person. She's so, it sounds like so nice. Yeah. She had visits in her time in the sponging house from a, a Mr. Falvey and her spiritual advisor. Uh, Mr. Falvey began raising money to pay off her debts. So Peg gets out of the workhouse and she's renting out her Blackrock house, which should be enough money to cover her living expenses. And Mr. Falvey gets her accommodation Mm -hmm. and she sets about writing the third volume of her memoirs, which was ready three months later. At this point, she kind of seems to have maybe like some depression or agoraphobia. She's very isolated and no one but her priest visits and Her priest is the one who proofread her final book, actually. Mm. She really hustled for this final volume. She wrote to everyone she knew and received a lot of subscriptions. She was very frightened Mm -hmm. to be seen in private and became very public. 
And this was kind of cemented by, it seems like the few times she did leave the house, she had some terrible experiences. Like one time she left the house and she came back and what little she owned and the money from her subscriptions had been stolen. Mm -hmm. Again, it's her 14 year old servant that she took in from a difficult background had done Mm. it. So Peg is left with just the clothes on her back and the money in her pocket. Oh, God. Waiting for more subscriptions. She gets a donation from the Earl of Bristol of £50. With this money, a friend convinces her to go to a tavern in town, where, unfortunately, some highway robbers tried to rob them. They were rescued before those men did anything to them. Mm -hmm. Theatre friends put on a show for Peg under a different name. But again, friends who worked the door pocketed the money. Mm -hmm. Peg name it, named and shamed these people in her book. But, you know, it's just, again, it's these people she'd kind of been working with before. I suppose they were all in on the con and the hustle and now they're conning and hustling her, you know. Mm-hmm. A friend convinced her to go for a walk where, sadly, they were attacked and raped by a gang. Oh, God. I know. A few days later, they both showed sign of the pox. <sighs> and um, so it's likely these men had some disease that they passed on to mm-hmm. them. Peg couldn't contact her own, her usual doctor and ended up with one who recommended mm-hmm. mercury poisoning, which was considered a cure for the venereal diseases. Mm, don't think that's how that works. No, it was basically like the mercury would make you so sick you'd sweat out the original disease, but many patients suffered brain damage, hair loss, tooth loss and ulcers from it and died. So a few months later, these two ladies were skin and bone and broke and were being asked to leave their home because they were behind on the rent. Mm-hmm. An old friend helped them get new accommodation, but Peg's health was continually declining. And she writes in her diary that she knew she was dying. While I write, I feel a gradual decline from a broken heart and destroyed constitution. My very brain wanders. I fear it is doomsday for me. In March 1797, her friend Peggy wrote, I am now to inform you that my poor companion, Mrs. Leeson, is in decline. No doctors could help and her spiritual advisor was a great comfort to her in her Mm. death. And it was on the 22nd of March that she said, my poor friend paid the great debt of nature. Peg's last words reportedly were quoting Rochester's elegy, eulogy. Eulogy, I don't really know what that is. All nature's work now from before me fly, live not like Leeson, but like Leeson die. Ah. After paying all her debts, there wasn't enough to pay for Peg's funeral. A nearby grocer proved a true friend and paid for the funeral. And several other friends are named as contributing to the service. Mm. Her obituary in the Dublin Evening Post said, She figured for a long time in the bomb town and absolutely made the fashion. It was her practice to confine her favours on one or, in other words, to select a temporary husband. It was in this state she lived with several gentlemen in a style of fashionable elegance. But before her death, her circumstances were so narrow as to leave her little above indigence. And that's the amazing story with a sad ending of Peg Plunkett or Mrs. Leeson. Oh, what a great story. Well done. And you were not kidding. Yeah. There's a lot going on in that one. And it's just sad. I think financial unmanageability is, again, another, like, I'd say common trauma response. Mm-hmm. You know, when you've lived your life in a lot of chaos and fight or flight stability feels really frightening and unfamiliar and enjoy the good times because bad times are just going to come soon anyway is your pattern um so i really feel for her and and her demise Mm -hmm. you know yeah very much so and she really shunned sex work and made a like penance you know before I, i don't know if maybe that was also her financial instability was she felt like she deserved it somehow for being a sex worker but my god she was a fucking legend (laughs) yeah Poor thing, what a lot to go through as well. Everyone I've summarised this episode to in Ireland has been so excited. Though. Yeah. It is such a great story. It is a really good one, yeah. And she was a bad bitch and should be <laughs> celebrated and remembered as such. Yeah. Should we do Gratitude Corner? What are you grateful for? Um, You know what? I am grateful for Chosen Family. I am grateful for the kind of people that you can trust completely and that you can be completely safe and completely yourself with. Yeah, that's a really wonderful thing. And I have, I have a few of those people and I'm very, very thankful for them. And I'm thankful for people who keep fighting even when things are terrible. 
we didn't we didn't talk mm. about this at the beginning and I probably don't want to talk about it much because I find it completely and utterly enraging but we are recording this episode in the week that the Supreme Court in the US officially overturned Roe v Wade and it's very easy to feel complete despair at that and it, and we and we should we should be sad we should be angry it's enraging it will kill people probably but i'm also seeing people and organizations rallying and working and fighting back and saying no this is not the end and we will not give up and that is i think giving all of us the hope that we need right now so i'm very thankful for people who are continuing to fight the good fight in the face of gestures at everything <laughs> What about you, Grace? So I'm really grateful for, I feel like I, in the last while I have a lot of increased energy, um, which is amazing because like for the last five years I have really struggled with Emmy. Mm -hmm. It's an absolute miracle for me to be do, able to do anything besides collapse and sleep after a day of work. Um, so I'm so grateful I have that and that I'm able to be creative for that. And like, I'm also grateful for myself for like, I started this episode by saying to Jess could we have an extra week off in the month coming up and like I would have never asked for that before uh, I would have felt like I have to keep up whatever level that I've made previously mm -hmm. whereas now I'm just like it's okay to take a crash week mm -hmm. um and um this is I think this will be done by the time we release this episode but I'm so excited for getting to do some uh, some podcasting stuff at Cork Bride liaising with artists to make stickers for our podcast and all that stuff and i'm grateful for peg yeah until next time horse whip the patriarchy and love women <laughs> bye bye <laughs> how can i get money for like not having sex with men <laughs> I want 500 guineas to annul a marriage. <laughs>